At Manpower, the mission is simple. Make a difference in individual and clients' lives by helping them win in the changing world of work. And the world of work certainly has changed during the more than six decades that Manpower has been in business. Today, Manpower is represented in more than 4,500 offices in over 80 countries and territories around the world. No other company has more experience or expertise in workforce solutions and in connecting people to the dignity and independence of work. The vision is one shared by the three CEOs who have led Manpower, Elmer Winter, Mitchell Fromstein, and today's Chairman, CEO, and President, Jeff Jarris. Three leaders committed to improving people's lives and the communities they serve. Their imagination and innovation helped shape an industry and create what Manpower is today, a global leader in the world of work. He says he could never have imagined it, becoming president of a company that would one day have offices across the globe. I was not an outstanding kind of a guy that was bound to succeed. I was just a nice guy. Elmer Winter looks back with amazement and pride. His idea for manpower was born in 1948. Elmer, a lawyer, and his partner, Aaron Scheinfeld, asked a former secretary to temporarily rejoin the team to meet a critical deadline. She saved the day. Aaron and I, and talking about our good fortune, thought maybe this was something that others might need, accountants, lawyers, business people. And uh, we thought, well, mate, why don't we start a company? The business started with both temporary office workers and industrial workers. Ad campaigns followed, hoping to recruit both clients and talent. Elmer's favorite was called the White Glove Girl. That was a program where it was fashionable for women to have white gloves over their purse. They walked down the street with the white glove. So we had a program Anybody who worked 100 hours got a pair of white gloves. The campaign enabled women to work as professionals, independent, strong. At the same time, the Reliables campaign was launched, focusing on men in light industrial jobs. The advertising took hold, and success began to take shape. Manpower expanded across the country. Chicago, Minneapolis, New York. So the question came up after we covered at about 200 offices in the U.S. What about going overseas? Some said you won't make it. And I said, well, why not? London came first. Two British women who occasionally worked as secretaries out of Manpower's Boston office asked to open an office back home. So we trained them for a week and sent them back to London. And that's really how we first got started in London, Paris, Stockholm, all through Europe. That's, these two young ladies really got us on that track. Eventually, the company went public. And as Manpower approaches 42 years on the New York Stock Exchange, Elmer remembers standing on the platform when Manpower first joined in 1967. And we had the hammer. And then all of a sudden, Manpower insignia was on the tape that everybody all over the world got. That was pretty exciting, pretty exciting. Throughout his presidency, and still today, Elmer committed himself to giving back to his community. I think social responsibility is extremely important for any and every company. I could never be satisfied if I knew there were people who were having trouble or falling through the cracks, and we were in it to help people as well. That's what, I think, helped us in the building of this company. Elmer Winter would serve as president of Manpower until his retirement in 1976. The new CEO, Mitchell Fromstein, had been on Manpower's board of directors for several years and had driven Manpower's advertising for 20. So it was really a question of, of um, moving my desk. His transition to CEO would be a natural one. His goal, to recognize that every person in the organization could provide value. His chance to demonstrate that came in 1982 with the advent of the computer. So suddenly, everything was different. 
That is, the skills that we needed to provide to companies were different. The skills that we needed to identify and people coming to us were different. All of these things were, were major changes in terms of, of how we were dealing with the people who came to us for work. Mitchell considered the challenge an opportunity. Manpower would embrace the new technology and train its workers to use it. A major competitor made the public statement, they're crazy, and I like that because I knew that we weren't crazy, and I knew our culture would take it and run with it. And run they did. The newly skilled workforce could not wait to share its knowledge with Manpower's corporate clients. There was a sense of pride and dignity among them. Typists, for example, who learned word processing, were asked to write a letter to Fromstein describing their training experience. They were treasures to me, because every morning, they would bring me a stack of hundreds and hundreds of these letters confirming exactly what we knew and that was this was an opportunity that they couldn't get in any other way. The world of work had been redefined by the computer and manpower with its already established global presence was in a perfect position to take advantage. One punch in the computer could feed the needs of, of a computer manufacturer in 12 countries in 10 minutes. The computer made it possible. The people of manpower made it happen. And while our business grew massively during the years that I ran the company, um, almost none of that was done with my two hands. The growth of the company into a a Fortune 500 company was done at the field level. That's the foundation of the manpower culture. People are its greatest asset. Mitchell Fromstein served as CEO for 23 years. His successor, Manpower's current chairman, CEO, and president would come from within the organization. Jeff Jarris, then the senior VP of European Operations. The day that I took over as CEO, I went out to dinner with Mitchell and his wife and my wife. And Mitchell sat across the table from me and he said, Jeff, I know you're not going to understand this, but I can tell you, I feel completely different than what I felt yesterday. The weight that's on my shoulders are completely gone and they are on yours. It is a weight he carries with pride in a world that is ever changing. Whether it be the, the, you know, early on in the career of the, the, the housewives coming out into the workforce or the senior population getting you know, integrated back into the workforce. Manpower has been on the front of those because we immerse ourselves into the world of work. And when you do that, you feel all of these energies that are going on and where it's going. That focus has served Manpower well as it has grown. 400,000 clients, 5 million people placed in jobs, 9 million trained, 33,000 employees worldwide. Right now we're a company of 33,000 people and if the 33,000 people weren't extraordinary people, um, I wouldn't be in this job right now. The success of the company can also be attributed to its commitment to diversity. It really is something that we feel strongly about only because what we're trying to do is to create the best organization. And we were one of the first uh, organizations to put a, uh, a woman in charge of a major operation 40 years ago in the UK. Today, women continue to be a driving force within the organization. In March 2007, Manpower named Francoise Gris president of its largest country market, France, where Manpower is also the market leader. That same year, Lucille Wu was named Managing Director of Manpower Greater China. And a year earlier, Barbara Beck was promoted to President of EMEA, Manpower's largest region, which includes 32 countries in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Manpower's global presence positions it well to do good. In the aftermath of the tsunami in late 2005, Manpower built a vocational training center in India to help people begin rebuilding their lives and their community. The fact that they stamped MP for manpower on every brick that they put when they built, rebuilt their town. Those are things that resonate with me personally, 
but more importantly, all the way through the organization. It is truly part of our DNA, and I think that's what makes our, our social responsibility programs so much more sustainable, is that it's baked right into the way our people think and act and live their lives. That same care and respect is demonstrated in everyday interactions with the people Manpower serves. At the end of the day, we still have that care and that understanding that they're nervous when they come in to be interviewed. That there's a sense of, I need this job and I'd like this job. And we treat that with a sense of dignity and respect. Holding on to these values will be critical to the success of Manpower as it moves forward. When we prepare ourselves for the next 60 years, and we look at taking 30-some thousand people and moving them forward, we need everybody to go there. They have to care for the brand. They have to realize that in a service organization, every phone call they make, every interaction they have with a candidate, every interview process defines the brand. Manpower's commitment as a global leader is to not only understand what's now, but what's next in the world of work, and help clients and individuals make sense of it. Where will there be shortages of talent and skills? What about global labor laws? The impact of immigration? How will technology continue to change the landscape? I get pretty excited when I talk about the future. You look at what we're doing in the emerging markets in Eastern Europe and what we're doing in the Middle East and Asia. I don't feel like we have even scratched the surface of the kind of impact we can make into people's lives. There's really a sense of energy, a sense of purpose. So we're kind of like a $23 billion startup that's 60 years old. I think that's pretty unique. Thank <laughs> you.